it's not about combining. Neither is it about salah. The rules in themselves, they just Allah just made certain rules just for the test. Allah doesn't need our salah. Mm. It's Sawm in itself is not the objective. This is why on Eid day is haram to fast. Salah in itself is not the objective. If it was a good thing in itself, it would not be haram to offer salah at sunrise and sunset. So it's not about what you're doing, it's about why you're doing. Assalamu alaikum everyone. With me, I have once again a really special guest, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Adam. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you in Leicester uh, at the Darul Ifta. It's a dream, I think a dream room for me and some of the other people in our uh, office because of all the books around us, mashallah. Um, but unlike us, you've actually read a bunch of these, uh, whereas we, we probably just collect them. Um, uh, Mufti Saab, we're going to go through a whole bunch of things, um, and I want to talk to you about uh, taqlid, I want to talk to, to, uh, to you about Hanafi fiqh, I want to talk to you about ijtihad, can we do it, who can do it, why can we do it, why can't we do it? Uh, but before I get into any of that, um, I wanted to dig into your, um, your travels, and uh, you're one of the, I think, few people that have actually really gone out there and traveled into the different lands uh, in, I think, the Bukhara region, in the Middle East, in the subcontinent. You've, you've traveled widely. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you how you found that experience, um, first of all. First of all, Jazakumullah Khair for coming today and, alhamdulillah, uh, honoring me with this uh, interview. May Allah reward and bless your efforts and uh, all the work you guys are doing. Ameen. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this opportunity to study and travel to different parts of the world. I mean, I normally say that the travels that I have done, um, there are maybe in three categories of travels. Uh, the first category of travels are those where I went specifically to study ilm and knowledge uh, to different countries, where I actually stayed at uh, places, locations, uh, for a year or a number of years, etc. And then after that, so th th that was, for example, I studied originally in the UK, and I studied in, uh, in Darul Bari in UK, studied in Pakistan, Darul in Karachi, I studied in Syria. I was there for two years in Syria. Uh, and then the second type of travel or travels is where after studying, I, I was still seeking, and I'm still seeking, of course, but I didn't travel where I w enrolled in a particular institute and stayed for a long time but it was just like a learning type of travel so I went to Egypt Azhar and I went to Jordan and I've been to I went to Morocco and you know many Muslim countries uh, India still remains on the list I haven't oh, you know, been I, I've been once when I was a child but uh, I haven't traveled to all the Darul Looms and the seminaries which I really need to do soon inshallah and then the third type of travel is after finishing studying, you know, to deliver courses and talks and etc. So, alhamdulillah, it's been, I mean, as I say, traveling really gives you a lot of knowledge and experience. I mean, I don't have that much knowledge, but it helps a student understand things better, uh, gives you experience. And uh, we see within our scholars as well, those who have traveled to different parts of the world and have seen different seminaries, different institutes, they, they have a very holistic and a very deep understanding of issues. And Mufisab, uh, could you share with us, I don't know, some anecdotes from your travels, something powerful or something funny or uh, something that was particularly emotive? I mean, there's so many things that uh, over the course of, you know, the years of studying, uh, I spent um, seven years at Dar Ulum in Bury, which is near Manchester, north of UK, good seven years, maybe a slightly more. Uh, a lot of people know of Darul Bari, Sheikh Yusuf Mutala, rahimahullah, who passed away. Of course, he was the principal and the Sheikh of many graduates who have graduated from there. But sometimes people uh, often forget another great Sheikh who was actually, I believe so, a teacher of Sheikh Yusuf Mutala, rahimahullah. Sheikh Islam al Haq, rahimahullah, was a teacher of Sahih al Bukhari, and he was very humble. You mentioned something powerful. Uh, many, many people don't know about him and they haven't heard about him as well. I mean, he, he was a great teacher, very, very knowledgeable, but very humble and very pious. 
I think he passed away in his 70s, late 70s, in 1997. So we were the final class who studied Sahih Bukhari by him. He taught us. I remember he said to us as well, that make dua for me. I don't stay very healthy uh, these days. He went for Umrah, uh, for Ramadan. And on 27th night of Ramadan in Medina al-Munawwara, in Ramadan, whilst he came back from... I'm sure it's Medina, Medina or Mecca, I'm not uh, exactly remembering, but I, I, as far as I remember, it's Medina al Munawwara. He came back uh, and he was offering tahajjud salah in his room, hotel room, and he went into sujood, and in sujood he passed away. Allahu Akbar. So it was Ramadan, 27th night, in haram, tahajjud salah, sujood. SubhanAllah, it's amazing. And uh, 16 years he taught many scholars, graduates of Darlun Berry in the UK, they all studied by him, even the senior ones great senior ones, they're all his students, and I believe he was also the teacher of Shaykh Yusuf Mutala, rahimahullah. Very humble, very down to earth, um, just when you, if you saw him, he was, they say about him that once he went out in Jama'at Tabligh, and nobody knew who he was, he's a Shaykh al-Hadith, and the Amir was somebody who wasn't a scholar, yeah. and uh, he just was listening to him, like, and the Amir was sitting, and every, okay, everybody perfect your shahada, your kalima, uh, do you know how to say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you repeat, they thought, uncle, you repeat, he just said, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad an abdu rasul, and he's a shaykh al-hadith, yeah. it's an absolutely unique, amazing person, maybe uh, sometime I want to sort of speak in more detail, or write something about him, um, he used to live in Bolton, he came, he was originally from India, uh, he taught many, many years there as well. So this is something that's just come to my mind. Um, Syria was, alhamdulillah, some great scholars. I mean, you, you know, these, some of these great shuyukh who are not that popular, but they're so pious and humble and connected to Allah. They put a massive impact on you. You know, this humility and humbleness and simplicity uh, that, that, you know, there was Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Halabi, rahimahullah, uh, the great Sheikh of Sham. They used to call him Shaykh al al-Sham and the Shaykh al-Sham and uh, Faqih al-Sham, Allamat al-Sham. He was a great Hanafi scholar, uh, great um, muqri, an imam in Qiraat. Alhamdulillah, I uh, received ijazah. I have a, his ijazah, which is uh, on the wall there. It's like a whole chain in Qiraat, going back to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to an tariq Jibra'il ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, you recite the Qur'an through memory, through various Qiraat, and he gives permission. Um, so he was also like that, very humble, very down to earth. I used to go and sit with him and he used to sometimes speak to me in a few words and he used to say a few English words, a few Urdu words. Oh, you knew Urdu words? Just well? a few words okay. here and there. Um, but he was an amazing person, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Halabi. He would sit in the Umayyad Mosque and for many years he taught Raddul Muhtar of Ibn Abidin al Shami. Uh, he taught uh, various books from cover to cover. And he was a teacher of many different shuyukh uh, of Syria. And Pakistan also, um, one of my main teachers, Shaykh Mufti Taqi Uthmani, Hafizahullah. I've said much about him, written much about him, but you know, the unique thing about him, despite all his knowledge, etc. Again, when you sit with him, his simplicity, his humility is just, you know, on a different level. So these examples of great scholars who are simple, Mountains of knowledge, despite being everything, not thinking anything of themselves. That, that, that is the greatest you know, trait a scholar can have. And this is exactly the trait of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. They were everything, but they never thought nothing of themselves. And this is the trait of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I sit like a slave sits, I eat like a slave eats, he would be one of them, not distinguished. And it's all there in the Shema. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something I think we need our young students, graduates, scholars to inculcate, you know. Inshallah, that brings love and respect in this world, but mainly according to Allah as well, by Allah, it gives acceptance. Definitely. Uh, there's a... I think it's Allah Iqbal who said that Ek hi saf mein khade ho gaye Mahmood Ayaz Mahmood Ayaz, yeah Na koi banda raha, na koi banda na waaz Yeah, it's a very famous two lines, yeah Yeah, and, uh, what you were saying, made, you know, all of these scholars are like that um, and Even in the past, our scholars I think I was reading somewhere, was it Ibn Hajar Asqalani and somebody else That he never used to address his student as my student He used to say, Sahibi, my companion mm. I saw the same thing with Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghud. I've never met him, but uh, he calls some of his students 
my companions, like Sheikh Muhammad Awama, uh, who's still alive, when he addresses him in one of his books, he says, uh, this is a student of yesteryear and a colleague of today. And says Sheikh, he doesn't say my student, my yeah, student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the same thing I've seen in Sheikh Mufti Taqi Uthmani, Hafizahullah. He always addresses his own students as my learned brother, I, as my respected brother. He never uses the word student. I've never heard him ever address or call his student by my student. Never. Never in any of his books and never verbally as well. I'm sure he has never said that to anyone, my student. Allahu Akbar. Um, Mufti Saab, I wanted to ask you a bit about the different teaching styles in the different areas, in the different countries, and uh, what were the differences that, and, and what were the benefits that you drew from that? Yeah, of course, all the countries, uh, <clears throat> despite teaching the same type of books, Dars Nidami curriculum we have, similar books with slight changes here and there, but similar books are taught um, in all these places. In terms of style, I, uh, there are a lot of similarities, but if you want to see, uh, talk about some differences, what I feel that I think in the subcontinent Madaris, whether it's India, Pakistan, and the UK ones which are based on the subcontinent ones, there's not uh, as much focus within them on memorization of mutun. Mm. So there's more emphasis on diraya, as we would say, comprehension, understanding. So go deep into the topic and understanding and analyze it. Uh, whereas in some of the Arab countries, like I saw this in Syria, there was a lot of qira'a and tilawa. That's why we have these, you know, maqra'as as well, just read, read, mm -hmm. not just hadith, but cover to cover. So for example, I was talking about Shaykh Abdul Razak Halabi, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. Uh, he taught, as in he read, Aqra'a, the whole Rad al-Muhtar, uh, we have here, eight volumes, cover to cover. So the students would read, they would read like 10, 12, 13, 14 pages. He would give a small commentary here and there, you know, explain one word here, one term there. But it's a cover of the text, from cover to cover. And then they would have a sanad going back from their teacher, teacher, all the way back to the author of the book. So when I went to Syria, I took some of these ijazat because I didn't find them in the subcontinent Madaris, like Aqidah Tahawiyah, I studied by a teacher, who studied by a teacher going all the way back to Imam Tahawi. Wow. Then you have uh, chains going back to Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad, and you know, authors of the book. So other than Hadith, chains, and also in the Quran we have chains. Reading books cover to cover. Now, what that's good, alhamdulillah, but sometimes it can then undermine or neglect in some way uh, the comprehension, understanding of what's being said. Whereas in the subcontinent, they're not really as uh, focused and uh, as particular about cover-to-cover -cover recitation. Uh, I'm talking about other than hadith, but they want to explain the topic at hand and study the book of fiqh. So they might read a couple of chapters or like half of this book and then a bit of this book, like hidayat. I don't see Hidayah, which is a Hanafi fiqh book, being completed cover to cover in the Indian subcontinent Darul Lums in within two years. It's every page is very difficult. Yeah. You'll only have to you'll have to do qira'a. So there's less qira'a, there's more diraya. The only exception is hadith, the Dawratul Hadith. That's the only exception. In the subcontinent, Dawrul Hadith, we must do hadith cover to cover, read as fast as possible. Whether the students are not understanding, understanding is like Wabihi qala hadithana, wabihi qala, it's very fast. And I have my own understanding of this uh, approach, but that's what they do there. Um, so that's the only exception. And um, if you were to, uh, do you think that there's benefit in both? Do you think that people should travel to different countries and you know, learn from different t types of methodologies or approaches? Uh, and, and also, it'd be interesting to hear your, like, culturally, uh, you know, if you walk into a Darul Ulum in the UK or the subcontinent, it's a certain, you know, you, you know that you're in a certain kind of place. Is it the same thing if you walk into a Darul Ulum in, let's say, Syria or how, how does it work out there? To answer the first part of uh, your question, in, uh, without a doubt, I always encourage and highly <clears throat> emphasize 
the importance of traveling and going to different places. The experience, you learn a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, and there's benefits in both places. There's good everywhere, subcontinent so Madaris. When I was studying in Syria, there were so many Syrian students who were asking me, how do we go to India? How do we go to Saharanpur? How do we go to you know these places? We want to do Dawratul Hadith, Arab students. Uh, many of them, even non-Arab students, but the ones who are studying there really, many of them wanted to go and study there because that's something that they didn't find there where they would read cover to cover and get ijazah, receive ijazah, sanad chains in Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasai, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawud. You know, you don't find the high strong chains of hadith uh, in, the, in the Arab world. And until today, a lot of the Arab scholars, they come to the UK as well. Um, two, three years ago, this Sheikh Nizam Yaqubi, who's very famous, he actually came here and he just wanted to read Mu'at by Malik and my father. Ah, and he sat and read him and there was Sheikh, uh, another Sheikh with him, Sheikh Ziyad Tukla. Uh, so they sat because they thought this was a very high Senate. So even subcontinent, there was a great old Sheikh here, Sheikh Ahmed Ali, Rahimahullah, he's passed away, living in Leicester. People, Arab scholars from Kuwait, from Bahrain, they would come Leicester, they took him to uh, the, the Arab world. And he, he couldn't even speak Arabic properly, but they just wanted a Sanid from him because this is something that they, you know, were lacking and yeah. they, they travel, you know, go to different, different places. Sanad from here, chain from here, chain from there. I said, I said to Sheikh Nidham Yaqubi once, I said, this is Salafi Sufism, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, you know, in, in the Tasawwuf people want this Sheikh and this Sheikh yeah, and this yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they, they don't go for the Tasawwuf Sheikh, but this, you're still going to this Sheikh it's and not. this Sheikh and it's not, yeah. you know. This is like, you know, very particular on which Sheikhs they have. So, definitely this is um, really good. You get benefit from both places. Like I said, Hifdul Mutun, where they memorize basic texts of fiqh and aqidah and, you know, uh, in the Arab world, which is very good. And this latter part about um, when you go to a madrasa, would you know that you've come into a madrasa? Um, yes and no. I think in the subcontinent uh, seminaries and dar rooms, there's a slightly bit more focus on the dress code, as right. we would say. Yeah. Uh, of course, akhlaq and tarbiyah, that's there in the Arab world, as well as in Turkey, as well as in, in the subcontinent madaris. It's everywhere. Ilm and amal, tarbiyah goes hand in hand. So the akhlaq, everything, it's the same. But the only slight difference is that the dress code, there's more emphasis in the subcontinent. So if you go to a subcontinent Dar al-Ulum, you will definitely see everybody uh, having a thobe, for example, or loose clothing. Uh, definitely everyone has a beard. Um, and many places have a, like a rule as well that you have to keep a fist full of a uh, fistful oh, right. beard, and if someone trims it, the student is actually expelled for that. Yeah, they, these are rules in most of the madaris. Whereas in the Arab world, um, now in the Arab world as well, if you go to the Khalij Gulf countries, like S S Saudi Arabia, and uh, where there's uh, people who uh, maybe don't follow the four madhabs, uh, they might be still quite strict on the beard and the length of the beard. But I'm talking about Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Egypt. Morocco, Egypt. All quite well, relaxed. Yeah, they're very relaxed and uh, you will see that majority are not wearing the thobe and the teachers are there, they, they come in suit and tie yeah. sometimes yeah, yeah. and things like that. So, I mean, for me it was a culture shock when I went. And I've talked about this once before in, in, in a recording as well, that uh, when I graduated from Darul Umbari and Darul Karachi in Pakistan and then I went to Syria, it was a massive culture shock. Um, I actually mentioned this, that I saw some of the shiuch having shorter beards. So because of that, I actually, you know, got this book published because of that. Wujub Ifa al lihya which is a book written by Sheikh Zakari Al-Kandahlawi, rahimahullah, Necessity of Lengthening the Beard, because I was very passionate about it. So this was in my first two months of studying in Syria. Right, 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 right. So what I did was I ordered a couple of copies from India and from UK, and I said, well, how comes you know, people of knowledge, teachers that don't have a long beard. Um, isn't this absolutely wajib fard, first pillar of Islam? Mm. You know? <laughs> because I had only studied in a traditional sure. Dar al a subcontinent one. So I said, I need to publish this book in Arabic and I put footnotes and Darul Fajr. Like this is a book written by Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria al-Kandahri, 
اعتنى به وعلق عليه you know footnotes by Muhammad bin Adam al-Kawthari Sheikh Muhammad Yusuf Mutala رحمه الله wrote a forward for me as well and I got it published and the thing I did which of course in hindsight uh, if I wouldn't do this right now I went and gave one one copy as a gift to all the shuyukh <laughs> some of them my teachers I remember Sheikh Wahab al-Zuhayli Oh yeah. Who's written Al Fiqh al Islami wa Adilla? He's one of your teachers. Uh, he, yeah, I used to attend some of his okay, lessons. Mashallah. He wasn't yeah, teaching yeah, there, yeah, but yeah. he used to have a lesson um, in, in the local masjid. I benefited from him, Mashallah. Yeah, yeah, Amazing yeah. person. I went and gave it to him as well, and he just looked at me like this. You know, he was just, I was, he was uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so, but then you learn slowly, slowly that it's not just one view about yeah, issues. And sure. so I think these kind of things really help by yeah. traveling. And uh, uh, Mufsab, I wanted to talk a little bit about Hanafi fiqh because uh, you have the, this ongoing uh, th- thing about Hanafi fiqh uh, that it's not necessarily as based on a hadith as some of the other madahib. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. But actually, perhaps before we get into that, even within the Hanafi fiqh itself, do you think that there's uh, a diversity of views from the different uh, travels that you've that you've done, uh, and my my under- very very limited understanding is that there's there are very clear schools that have developed over time, and uh, particularly the early Ahnaf, they they might have had a very different perspective, and then you've got people uh, who I think where they refer to as the Transoxania region, they have got their own perspectives, and you know you've got mod- modernist views, but yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective on uh, on Hanafi fit. I think in terms of the main rulings of the fiqh, of the madhab, they're the same everywhere. Subcontinent, Turkey, and Biladuma Wara in Nahar, Transoxiana or Transoxania, whichever yeah, yeah. way you want to pron- pronounce, Central Asian lands, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Kyrgyz, all the Stan countries. Um, so that's where Hanafi fiqh was predominant. The land of Imam Bukhari is Hanafi madhab. Um, you know, you, it's also ironic that all these places, land of Imam Bukhari, Imam Tirmidhi, it's all Hanafi fiqh prevail there. I remember when we traveled there once, I, I wrote this in one of my books, that uh, before answering your question, but we went to one madrasa, and on, on the madrasa, uh, in a classroom, there was a big like a uh, chart on the wall where the students had compiled a shajaratul nasabil ilm of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. So all the teachers of Abu Hanifa, and, you know, all like of And at the bottom, it was written, "May yuridil lahu bihi khairan yufaqihu fi din." Whomsoever Allah grants good, good uh, wants good for Allah grants him good understanding of knowledge. So I looked at that, and then I wrote about that that we were we were on our way from Bukhara to Tirmidh, leaving the town and of one great muhaddith, Imam Bukhari, and going to another, the city and town of another muhaddith, Imam Tirmidhi. And this place, it was all Hanafi fiqh. And the shajaratul nasab of Imam Abu Hanifa. So it, it just gave us a reminder that hadith and fiqh always stood side by side. Mm. One is the hadith transmission of the wording, and the fiqh. Fiqh is basically the understanding. You know, some mm. people think, what is fiqh? Uh, is It's separate or alien to... Quran and Sunnah. Fiqh means, yeah. when people say, what is fiqh? I say understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. Fiqh means understanding. So it's a fiqh, it means the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. So uh, all these three places, I think predominantly the main issues, like if you look at, you know, classical tahara, salah, saum, zakat, main rules are the same everywhere. Um, in terms of differences, uh, I think they're very far and few. Uh, there may be differences in modern issues. That's number one. Uh, and there may be some issues in which there are differences from different parts of the world. Like, like let's take, for example, the issue of the beard, the same example mm. that I gave. What is the ruling? Is one fist wajib, or is it sunnatul mu'akkada, or is it sunnatul ghair mu'akkada? There may be some differences of the Hanafis in different parts of the world. I saw one thing I saw a difference was this taking from another madhabs, picking and choosing from another madhabs. The subcontinent ulama and scholars are quite strict on this, that you don't pick and you don't take from other madhabs unless yeah. it's absolutely necessary, darura, with a lot of conditions in place. Whereas uh, Hanafis of Syria, for example, I'm not sure about Turkey if they are strict as the subcontinent ones, but Syria, Jordan, 
Lebanon, these countries, I've seen that the Hanafis there as well, they, they're a bit relaxed. Mm. And I think the reason is because, like you might have a family, you might have a brother who's a Hanafi, sister who's a Shafi'i, the mother's probably Maliki, father's Hanbali. So when you see in the same family people yeah. practicing different madhabs, it makes you a bit more relaxed and lenient to, because you don't feel that as though what the other is doing is kufr or something like that. You know, it's just yeah. it's part yeah. of the yeah. system. Whereas in the subcontinent, it's only Hanafis or some Shafis, but it's so... This is something, you know, taken from another madhab uh, is a difference uh, within the subcontinent and, and the Arab world. But I think generally, I mean, there isn't that many differences in rulings as such. Hmm. And uh, Mutisab, do you think that there's like a stylistic difference as well, which sometimes people who are perhaps starting off in their um, knowledge uh, seeking journey they uh, they don't see um, so a lot of I think uh, and, and correct me as well if you think that this is not fair but I, I feel like Hanafi fiqh is it's almost like a martial art style like it's a different style and Hanafi fiqh it's uh, they will. There are certain books where there will be a hadith in there, but really, it assumes that you all you know all of all of those hadith, and now it's getting into the fiqh and it's getting into the back and forth of that, and and I think if uh, and then there there are different approaches where they they actually start with the hadith, and they will then build off the back of that, and so if that's your mindset, and you you recognize that is how you do fiqh. And then you see this other, just stylistically different approach of a different uh, academy of scholars. You don't realize that actually this is a fiqh book and this is not, the, the hadith is almost, this is a given. Mm. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're studying fiqh and then you, like in the subcontinent madaris, you would be studying hadith before fiqh. So in generally, but even though in the initial years we do have books like Riyadh al-Salihin and maybe Arba'een of Imam Nawabi rahimahullah and those kind of Mishkat al Masabi, but it's basic texts of fiqh, Nur al Ibah, Mukhtasar al Quduri. Now, if a student thinks here, where's the Dalil and where's the Hadith and stuff like that, you know, this is not the place for it. Uh, whereas in some other parts, they, they read like books like Bulugh al Maram of Ibn Hajar Asqalani. It's like Hadith, Ahkam based Hadith. Mm. So you just you go through hadiths and you understand the fiqh. That's also n not it's a problem. Approach, yeah. yeah, it's an approach. Um, so it's either way. It's like you're going from you, you hold your ear this way, or you hold it this way. You know, you're still holding the ear basically. <laughs> the so. big question is: Should you uh, wipe? Should you clean behind the ear for? Muti <laughs> 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 um, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, ijtihad. Can we do it? Depends who you mean by we. Can you do it? Can I do it? Can Kabzi do it? I, I can't do it without a shadow of doubt. <laughs> then I can't do it either then. Yeah, you Kabzi, mean, you're you, right. You, you can't do it either. Uh, this we is a... You see, the, the point here is that there's two extremes to this. Uh, some people say that Ijtihad door is absolutely shut, uh, shut locked. Keys turned, taken away, and the keys are thrown into Atlantic Ocean and you can never find those keys. That's it. This door is never opening ever until humanity ends. And on the other hand, every Tom, Dick and Harry, every person who does a weekend course and every person who's an expert who wants to do ishtihad, like there was this, uh, without taking names, um, this modernist uh, female lesbian woman who wrote a book uh, on his trouble with Islam or Muslims or something, I don't know. It's quite famous. She used to say, she, there's, her clips are there, she still says, I'm a mujtahid, you know, mm. I understand the Quran myself. Quran is for everybody. Like, why are the scholars creating a monopoly? Mm. This has been an old age kind of attack that scholars have this monopoly closed elite box that nobody else can come into your elite room. And that's also wrong. The truth is in the middle that the door of Ijtihad is not absolutely locked and shut. It's still open, but it's open. It's just ajar. Just, it's, mm. very, it's very tight. You know, uh, only few people and it's very difficult to get through. You can't be fat if you go through that, you know, you need to be slim and you need to, you need to have tayyib, healthy, ilm and knowledge. Mm. So there are requisites and, you know... What do you mean by ijtihad, uh, Sheikh? Ijtihad, you know, the, there's two types of ijtihad. One is redoing ijtihad on 
classical rulings, and we normally say that's done and dusted with. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Mm. But modern issues, mm. modern issues which are which come up and will should continue to come up, and that's what fiqh is. Mm. So the door uh, for ishtihad is open for that, but it has to be people who are expert mutabahir ulama, like high level. Mm. You see, we, we, we don't have what Christianity have like you know they just have certain people like the pope the bishop the cardinals only they can make decisions and they can't be questions the pope is ma'asum according to them within catholics um, and if the pope makes a ruling that's it that's that's like wahi yeah. the hindus have the same thing as well um you, you have to be of a certain cultural background as well it's elite uh, whereas in islam anyone can become a mufti, qadi, mujtahid, it's not a revert, a convert, anybody. But like with everything else, with every discipline, you have to have expertise, you have to have certain criteria, conditions. Like, like in medicine as well, you know, we don't, you know, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Bughudda, rahimahullah, uh, who's quite famous, he once visited Pakistan when he was coming back. He went visit Pakistan many times. When he was leaving the airport, somebody asked him, he said, Sheikh, how did you find our country? He said, Alhamdulillah, amazing country. But there's every Tom, Dick and Harry, every average person on the road is a doctor and every average person is a mufti. <laughs> everyone wants to give you, like, prescribe a medicine and everyone wants to give you a fatwa. So there has to be a criteria mm. of ilm, of knowledge, of salah, of taqwa, of piety, uh, without which, I mean... Like everyone's an expert except the experts, as they say, when it comes to Islam. When it comes to medicine, no, you, you know, mechanic, every aspect of life, we refer to the experts. Let them decide. So this is as well in Islam. Yeah, If you want to do ishtihad, if somebody wants to do ishtihad, spend 15, 20, 30 years, 30 good years of deep studying, you know, traditional studying, and then inshallah. So with modern issues, uh, we have great scholars who... Do some sort of ijtihad. Yeah. Um, as you know, the Islamic Fiqh Academy, International Islamic Fiqh Academy based in Jeddah. That was the reason it was established in the 1980s or late 70s. Uh, Sheikh Mufti Taqithmani Hafidhullah was a vice chair for many, many years and he's still a permanent member. And um, I've actually seen some of his meetings, like subhanAllah, online meetings when he was, through the COVID times. He was chairing a meeting um, with, with the, the, the Bahrain based IOFI. Oh, yeah. I see his laptop and I was, I was, he used to tell me, he said, you can come and sit down. So I just sit at the corner and just drink tea and just watch him two hours. SubhanAllah. It's like, these are the cream scholars, but the way the rest of the Arab scholars respect him. Mm. Like, and the way he also listens to everybody. What, they're all disagreeing. What do you say? What do you say? Okay. okay. And then he just says something and all of them say, Ala rasi wal ayn. Alhamdulillah, shaykhana. That's it. You've given the fatwa. It's done. And, you know, there were people like Sheikh Abdullah al Mani'. Who is the advisor to the kingdom in Saudi Arabia? Mm. And all these people out of the Bahrain based IOFI. So these are what all these groups, the, the IOFI, the International Fiqh Islam, uh, Academy of Jeddah, there's the International Fiqh Academy of India. And then also in the West, there's, you know, people have these kind of um, uh, groups of scholars yeah. where they do ishtihad on modern issues. Yeah. But like I said, it's not for everybody. So, Mufti um, let's get really practical then. How, how, do I, uh, as a lay person, Kabzi, Khizr, as lay people, how do we recognize a scholar? Because I have a look and I say, okay, he's got his red, red uh, thing on, so he must be from Al-Azhar. He's speaking Arabic nicely. He's not doing, you know, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salah. He's got some other, you know, stuff going on. Uh, and it looks smart. It's got it a looks nice scarf. Smart. I it forgot look... to wear my scarf. Today. I know, I know. It's <laughs> all right, don't worry, I've seen it. <laughs> It's too hot so, to wear scarves. So he looks smart and he he's giving a few different perspectives, maybe chucks in a few hadith in there. And I'm like, okay, yeah. So what what is the, uh, for the lay person, how does one recognize? Uh, this, this is something that's so important. I've been asked by people, students in various classes this question many times. And it really it's, normally I give a first one, I give a simple answer. I say to them, how do you recognize a doctor? That's a simple answer. But there is a difference. So that answer is not satisfactory. But how would you recognize a doctor? Uh, because you want to give your your health, your body, your well-being of yourself in the hands of somebody. This is your, you want to give the well-being of the akhirah, your spirituality in the mm -hmm. hands of someone else. 
So I say to the people normally that, look, the, the amount of effort you put in to find the right doctor, okay? Anyone who looks like a doctor, he's got an iPad, you know, he just dresses well, he looks the part. I once changed a doctor because I went to him and when I told him my symptoms, he, he was checking Google. Straight away, I left that place and next, I just changed my doctor. I said, like, why are you checking Google for? You know, so I always say to the people that, look, when someone's not a mujtahid and someone's from the general public, it doesn't mean you are dumb. Allah has given everybody aql brain. Mm. At least that much that you can recognize scholars. Otherwise, la yukallifu Allahu nafsayin la wus'aha. Allah wouldn't make you accountable for something. As long as people put in the effort, as much as effort of, as they would put to find the right mechanic, car, you know, when we want to take our car somewhere, we'll ask so many people, are you sure? Take second opinion, third opinion, you know. So much effort is put in. Likewise, with now with scholars and mechanics probably is a better example because with the doctors they've got the certificate and you know yeah. uh, as long as they're accredited. Whereas, I mean we may talk about this, but those who just graduate because it's not official official doesn't yeah. mean someone who's a graduate is really a scholar. It's the same as another graduate. Yeah, yeah it's not the same. Yeah, thing. you might have one class in the Darulum. They both graduated from the same class, and the difference yeah. between the two is miles apart. Hmm. Like. Thousands of miles apart. But the system is because it's not official government based accredited system, everyone gets by through. So I think just being a graduate and just having the title Maulana shouldn't be. And I will say that we shouldn't call ourselves Alim. It's just a graduate. Uh, so the way to find out is do your homework and research. Like who do they study by? How many years have they studied? Let's see their works. Have they done some works? You know, ask other scholars. You ask other people in the industry, what do you think mm. of this person? Uh, and ask those people who might not have their own personal interest in mind because sometimes, you know, they say in the hadith as well, don't, you know, hadith criticism, the, the one in the same era, don't ask the opinion, mm. you know, because there could be biases, biases yeah. jealousy, you know, yeah, yeah, competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you have to put in the effort. And once someone puts in the effort and they istafti qalbak and your heart feels content, then no problem, go ahead and and if... In that case, you made an error, then inshallah, there will be no accountability from Allah because you put in the effort. Hmm. If someone did taharri for qibla, as much effort to find the direction of the qibla and then they ended up praying the wrong way, salah is valid. Qadr Allah, yeah. Hmm. So, uh, Mufti Sahib, what about, there's, there's this line of levels of ijtihad, right, where you're trying to apply the classical, like the nusus to some kind of modern thing that's happening, or, or just some kind of thing that's happening. You're trying to um, trying to figure out what does Allah want here, and um, you're a mufti, and you get asked lots of questions, and each situation is is at a certain level novel, uh, so it's got its own unique circumstances. So, to some extent, arguably, isn't that some level of ijtihad, but it's like some kind of minor level of ijtihad, and then you might have some major levels of ijtihad that uh, someone might need to do on, I don't know, some kind of very new circumstance, like I think the the augmented reality, the virtual reality stuff that's coming very soon, that's going to pose really interesting questions. Is is there a line or like how, how would you think about that? Maybe you could say that um, <clears throat> different levels of ijtihad in terms of the the issue at hand. So, like you mentioned, that sometimes it's just a very small, limited type of ishtihad involved. So, yeah, I think it, to do high-level ishtihad, you need high-level knowledge. And also, you need, need it done as a collective. There's a hadith where, uh, the, I think Sayyidina Ali radiallahu asked the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ نَزَلَ بِنَا أَمْرٌ فَمَاذَا تَأْمُرُنَا If we get new issues, what do you advise us? He said, شَاوِرُ الْفُقَهَا الْعَبِدِينَ When new issues arrive, uh, arise, then consult al-fuqaha al-abidin who are worshippers so those who are also righteous and pious so it's collective that's why these issues should be collectively ijtihad should be done collectively so i mean like for me personally because this related you know through experience i have always avoided doing ijtihad until now i just feel very very scared Khatarun Azim, Imam Nawi says this Ajra'ukum ala al futya, Ajra'ukum ala nar. The most courageous amongst you, this is a hadith of the Messenger, Imam Nawi talks about it in his Muqaddimah of Al Majmu'. 
the one who is most courageous amongst you on fatwa is the most courageous to go into hellfire. Mm. If, I mean, if you read that chapter of Imam Nawawi, Muqaddimah, on Usul al iftar it just, you don't want to give fatwa. But this fatwa that I give and many of, like myself, and many people like me give, is not really a fatwa, fatwa, ijtihad, it's just naqal. So I always give a ruling based on what other people have said before. I don't mm. want to take the responsibility. So it's not a real fatwa in the traditional sense because a real fatwa is ijtihad. Mm. So we just do naqal of fatwa. Until today, there's only one issue, uh, but until today, I have been so scared. And I always, I don't want to take this responsibility or the ruling of this responsibility just on my back. I'm just saying, what's the others have said? If Allah asks me, ask them, <laughs> not me. So. I don't want to take, that's me personally, I just don't want to take the responsibility. But Mufti Sab, I, what I would say to that, um, as a different perspective is, in the UK, you're one of the senior scholars, I think that's fair to say, in, you know, certainly in, uh, in the UK. And people would look to you, they clearly do look to you, right, for lots of answer, questions and answers. So if they can't uh, get the answer from you, uh, where, where do they go, is the first question. And then... I think the second, uh, the second um, point I would make is that uh, you also, we also don't want to be in a position where we, uh, because we're encountering, I think I feel like progression is happening at a faster rate than before. And there are so many novel circumstances and, and our scholarly class is historically underfunded. So there's less scholars, there's less progression and all this stuff. And I feel like there's, uh, there's so much ambiguity that, um, if people can get some kind of a steer or some kind of a clarification that can help unblock them. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to get your... Uh, without a doubt, of course, uh, there are issues and people look to scholars and who they perceive as scholars. It doesn't mean that they won't get answers. They will get answers, but remember, everyone's looking up to someone else. So even in, when we say we follow madhabs, like even the madhabs are based on what they looked at, the sahab tabi'ud and the sahaba, so everyone's... So, Everyone has people above them have you know precedence and, and knowledge and ilm and treasures before it. So, like for example, in UK, if there are scholars who people ask questions, then they will have their teachers, and everybody re refers back to their teachers and the understanding of their teachers. And so this is what I'm saying that they will get answers, but it's not your own independent. Mm. I'm not making that decision myself based on my ishtihad. Mm. I have scholarship teachers who are still alive mm -hmm. many of my teachers have passed away rahimahumullah but i have teachers who are alive uh, and i would refer to them and if it's a new issue i would see what they have said um, maybe our time might come who knows when, when allah give long life inshallah if i'm about 60 70 and i have no teacher who is still alive yeah then even then you know sheikh taqlu uthmani rahimahumullah used to say to us and i think he quoted this from his father but that when you have uh, those who are your teachers alive, above you, formerly people who are senior to you, not just teachers but senior, mm -hmm. always consult them. When there's no seniors left and you have compatriots, same level as you, then consult them. And then when you get to an age when you don't have those compatriots as well, you have juniors to you, students, then ask them as well, don't hesitate. Mm. I sometimes, I have... Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't like to say my student, but somebody who studied by me uh, or sometimes I asked them, like I had a question last week on inheritance and I said, okay, can you just... So I asked them as well. Hmm. Uh, so there's no embarrassment in asking your fellow students, uh, people who studied by you for rulings and for a second opinion. So I think as long as it's done with consultation, second opinion, not becoming arrogant about it, uh, modern issues in the UK, I think the muftis and the scholars, they should sit together and, and look at it collectively. And I'd love to get your perspective, Mufti Stab, on um, the... Because I, I, we're in the technology world. We do a lot of investing in startups. And so our, our head is always about 10 years into the future because that's what we're trying to see into the future in some level. And, uh, and the rate of progression is crazy because at each inflection point of technology, it, it leverages the, the speed mm. even further. And we're seeing that, that with artificial intelligence right now. And, uh, and my like, one, one like, thought here is that if we as a Muslim community, uh, and particularly the scholars, are unable to 
move um, in ambiguous territory quickly. Uh, not, I'm not saying uh, really hastily and to the point of it being foolhardy, but relatively quickly, then Muslims will be left behind. Is, is the theory. So, for example, to give a really crystal form of this, um, uh, let's say blockchain technology is a technology that's new. And, and I think uh, due to the, uh, as I've mentioned, the, some of the um, structural weaknesses in, in the Islamic scholarly uh, systems that we have today, um, often economic, it takes a while for scholars to mm. be able to get up to speed mm. and then opine on it. And by that time, the the horse is bolted mm. and i feel like if that keeps on happening especially in this era where things are moving so fast that this this is actually quite detrimental possibly mm. for muslims mm. i think this is one of the things of the hanafi madhab you know they were accused and uh, maybe attacked and reprimanded for discussing issues that had not occurred yet just in anticipation. This was one of the things that the Hanafi mother was unique with. Yeah. That's why Sheikh Abdul Fattah Baghuda Rahmullah wrote a book, uh, Manhaj al Salaf and his Su'al fil Ilm, was Su'alu ma yaqa wa amma lam yaqa. You know, talking about issues which haven't occurred, which may occur. So many of the traditional scholars, they disagreed with this. La tis'alu an ashia, and you know, don't go into issues that are not, not coming to existence. But I think definitely in anticipation of what's happening. Um, but I think it just needs precaution, it needs ihtiyat, uh, and it needs collective, collective. Mm. So I think uh, if collectively scholars look at these issues and uh, maybe, I think we have some scholars who sit uh, on a regular basis in the UK as well. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the way. Just the, the issue is, it's not that we should just leave it, we should definitely uh, look into these issues, but it should be done with a lot of precaution mm. and it should be collective. It shouldn't be just one individual mufti saying this is the ruling because these are new modern issues. You have to be very careful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and Mufti Sal, I wanted to talk about uh, Taqlid. Uh, sh yes or no? <laughs> of course, yes. With, with expansion. <laughs> of course, yes. Unless you're a person. Taqlid is basically a simple, it's an o old issue. It's either a person's mujtahid or a non-mujtahid. Mm. For a mujtahid, taqlid. For a non-mujtahid, doesn't have to do taqlid. I mean, mm. it's as simple as that. And I think we've come now, everyone's come around to the idea. There was a time where people used to be uh, quite fascinated by this non taqlid approach. But now I think most people understand uh, that you can't force non taqlid on anyone. It's like mm. saying to someone, someone says, look, I'm not a mujtahid, I'm not qualified, I want to do taqlid. The other person is saying, no, no, you are mujtahid, you must not do taqlid. But if he's saying that I'm not a mujtahid, okay, yeah. if you don't want to do taqlid, you think you're a mujtahid, up to you. But why force yeah. me to not do taqlid? I don't feel, you know, right that I don't do taqlid. So I think, in generally, taqlid is uh, of a madhab, it's necessary, of course. Um, Makes sense. And Mufsa, would you say that, uh, at what point does it make sense for someone or a student of knowledge or a scholar to uh, contemplate mixing and matching madhahib? And by that, I don't mean... Uh, like wholesale, like mixing and matching, but it might be that in in a line of thought, uh, you let's say I don't know in Hanafi fiqh where uh, in tahara there's like a a specific mindset that Hanafi fiqh has about tahara, which is much, it's a much more physical thing uh, as opposed to some of the other madahib, and that's a point of uh, uh, you know divergence between the different uh, madahib, and if you uh, take a certain perspective on it you might still be a fundamentally a Hanafi but you might just have come to a slightly different perspective and then it goes down a different path um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on yeah when when does a when does it make sense for someone in their mm. scholarship to be yeah the, the critical word here is scholarship as you've said uh, because here as well we can have two extremes for some people sticking to a madhab is it's like an absolute fard so necessary that if someone comes out it's like committing kufr again Sheikh Abdul Fattah Baghuda Rahmullah comes to mind he was in Pakistan and uh, he did he, he was traveling and he combined between prayers so there was a on the airport or somewhere so there was another Sheikh Hanafi Sheikh uh, he, he said to him Ya Sheikh Anta tajma' bayna salatayn like Sheikh are you combining between two prayers you know because you're a Hanafi so Sheikh Abdul Fattah Baghuda Rahimahullah he said to everybody he goes the way he's telling me is like Hal kufran? 
<laughs> are you committing kufr? Like the way he said it, yeah. you know, the, his approach was like as though I've committed kufr. So that's one extreme where there's a lot of stubbornness on you can never ever come out and, and take for another opinion. But then on the other hand, especially in this liberal society where it's become just so open, every person, anytime, morning I'm a Hanafi, afternoon Shafi, evening Maliki and fourth wife at night, four wives in one day. You know, it's just pick and choose and it's all relaxed. And if it's allowed in another madhab, it's allowed or why, you know. And I think that's a, that's a really dangerous uh, mm. route as well. So the, the, the answer to this question is when someone wants to take from another madhab, you ask them why, what's mm. the point? Yeah. What's the reason behind it? Is it the reason is because it's just convenient and it's easy? Then that's going against the whole objective. And I've explained this. So I have a very detailed course on taqlid, which also I offered um, a few years ago, like good 10 hours. We looked at all these issues in a lot of depth, uh, which now is like an on-demand course on our Dar Lifta website. Uh, but we had, alhamdulillah, many, many students who enrolled in this course in there I explained I said the whole concept it's not about and I feel very strongly about this that these rules are not the objective in themselves the ultimate objective and what Allah requires from us is submission mm. the whole this life is a struggle the sabr that you do is jannah so it's submission. Submission means like, it basically means that I do things which I don't feel like doing, but I still do them. Mm. There are things which I feel like doing and there might be waking up for Fajr. I don't feel like, you know, it's difficult. But I submit. So it's not about the rule itself. And this I've tried to explain to a lot of people. I remember one sister asked the question that, look, um, there's a ruling in the Shafi'i Madhab. Let's just take this one, combining between prayers. She said to me that if, is it allowed in the Shafi'i Madhab? I said, yes, allowed. So if a Shafi'i combines prayers whilst traveling, will Allah punish that? I said, forget punish. We don't know who Allah punishes anyway. But is it wrong? I said, yeah, it's wrong. Uh, it's not wrong for that Shafi'i person. So why, if I do it, it's wrong and Allah will take me to task for it? Will Allah take Imam Shafi'i to task for the combining prayers? So is it like angels will be there? Combining Hanafi, okay, you combine prayers this way. Shafi, you can find prayers that way, you know. Yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, you're in trouble, trouble just because <laughs> if the issue is why. So this is a common question that comes into the minds of people. I said to her, look sister, it's not about combining. Neither is it about salah. The rules in themselves, they just, Allah just made certain rules just for the test. Allah doesn't need our salah. Hmm. It's psalm in itself is not the objective. This is why on Eid day is haram to fast. Salah in itself is not the objective. If it was a good thing in itself, it would not be haram to offer salah at sunrise and sunset. So it's not about what you're doing, it's about why you're doing. When the Shafi'i does it, it's not because he combined prayers. He got a package of rules in which there were things which were easy, difficult, he wanted to do, he doesn't. He, this, uh, irrespective of what he felt like, I just submit. And as part of the package, there was one easy ruling. Yeah. The Hanafi took his package and there's ease here, there's difficulty, it balances itself out. But as part of his package, he got a ruling which is difficult. So it's the reasoning and the motive behind it that you're not submitting to Allah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's makes, the idea. Makes sense. So this is why I think picking and choosing, unless there's cases where you have to and there's a need and you know, because sometimes there's darura and haja and it's difficult. And then again, scholars make that decision. So this, just to end this, that when does a scholar uh, in scholarship diverge I think it depends you know if if so that's the ruling for the general public why they're doing it if someone is moving out because they genuinely feel the dalil is strong then it goes back to their level are they mujtahid or semi mujtahid mm. I, I've created this term semi mujtahid as well <laughs> you know some of the early scholars say mutabahir mm. not a mujtahid but mutabahir alim like an Imam who is very deep in his knowledge. A lot of these, like Imam Nawawi was a Shafi'i, but he did some ijtihad. So it's like semi-mujtahid. Uh, because they have this discussion, is ijtihad, can it be yet a jazza? You know, can you, can, do you have to be a full mujtahid or a full non-mujtahid? Yeah. So early scholars decide, discuss this, and the common opinion is that, no, it's not a, like a, you, you be a full mujtahid or a non-mujtahid. You could be overall non-mujtahid, but in certain... So for example, there's one issue, he spent two years just investigating the issue of 
whether you know, combining between prayers. He did so much work, so much effort, and through his research, and he had the qualities and capabilities, he came to the conclusion that it's completely fine, no problem. Even though he's a Hanafi, he's following it based on Dalil, mm. then that's okay. So I think if it's done on evidence and based on Dalil, and then you have the requirements and the conditions, then it's okay. Um, so this is, you know, I think you just need to be a bit balanced about these issues. No, I completely agree, Mufsab. Um, Mufsab, I wanted to, um, before wrapping up, just get your thoughts on Dar ulums today. What's the, what are the strengths, particularly in the UK, but what are the strengths and what are the things that we should look to try and improve or progress on? Strengths, alhamdulillah, you know, they've been established since the 1970s, Dar ulum very, in, you know, near... Manchester, then there was one, there's one in Dewsbury, and then the Blackburn, and then even Leicester we have a few, mashallah, so many in Birmingham, different parts of the country. Some of them, majority are boarding, and some are non-boarding, just daytime, these seminaries. The strengths, in terms of uh, terbiya, is the very good, generally. I mean, there are always you, exceptions yeah. in everything, but generally, terbiya-wise, Alhamdulillah, a lot of the parents send their children because they want to preserve the Iman and save them from the bad, e evil environment around around us. So the Iman is protected, it's safeguarded, they get a good tarbiyah, good Islamic tarbiyah, they become pious, righteous. In terms of knowledge, they get good basic grounding of Islamic knowledge, etc. Um, so there's definitely, these are good positives and some of them, from them, come out to be great stars of the world, mashallah, you know, even in the UK we've got great scholars who are the product of the rooms. Um, so many who graduate. But the negative, or, or let's say, not, not negative, but something to improve on, is that these stars that have come out, we can probably count on, the, you know, two hands, fingers of two hands. Yeah. Uh, thousands have studied and graduated, mm. but the ratio is very less. And there's a reason behind that is because I think Number one, it's the, these are not official accredited Darulums, the private institutions. Um, there's more focus on tarbiyah than ilm sometimes, uh, and anyone and everyone can enroll. Sometimes they're just enrolling just because they've not been good at home and the parents just send them so they just do a course five six years they graduate and then they go in a different field and they don't really sometimes I mean I, I know there's places where uh, students haven't studied much or you know learnt much at all or you could you could you could not even call them really a graduate to be honest um, it's the levels I don't want to you know say too much negative so I think you know one of the ways this can improve and this what I'll just say and I've been saying this for a few years is that these there are looms or seminaries, they should have two sections. Two sections. One is what we call the Imam course. Mm. The Imam course, which could be four years, which could be five years. And this is another problem. Everyone wants part time. Everyone wants five years, four years, because everybody is just after that title, Maulana. Mm. Whether you, someone gives you the cake in you know one week, I'll take it. It's not about really seeking knowledge, which is wrong. You know, it's so. You have the Imam course, which could be four years, which could be five years, where you focus on tarbiyah, you preserve the Iman, and teach them the basics. They don't have to complete the six books of hadith. They don't have to read hidayah cover to cover. I always tell the students, if you're studying hidayah, the hidayah is not a book for everyone. Hidayah is for those who are becoming mujtahids, semi-mujtahids mm -hmm. at least. Yeah. It's a high-level book of Islamic fiqh, it just it teaches you Islamic legal system, you know, like Hidayah is not teaching you fiqh, it's telling you the makeup of fiqh, it's mm. the factory. Quduri is like where you sit in the car, this is a factory, you go and see how cars are manufactured. It's like you see all the wiring and all the system yeah. behind. And this is, if you're not going to be a mujtahid, you don't need all of this. There's so many books that students study in Darulams which they don't uh, have any connection to after they graduate. You don't need that book for, to be an imam. You don't need that book to be a chaplain. You don't need that book uh, to to be a Islamic teacher in a school. So there's, I think, you know, they just read the book for the sake of reading it. Yeah. So you have that five-year course, call it the Imam course. Basics, Quran, basic tafsir, a bit of Arabic, Nahwa Sarf, uh, some hadith, some fiqh, you know, nice five-year yeah. course. Maybe some modern issues. Yeah, some modern issues that they need. And they can be an imam for, with mm. that. Yeah. Social skills, you know, communication skills and things like that. 
along with that side by side you have a proper alim course which is at least nine years alim course cannot be less than eight in, in pakistan india it's at least eight nine years here people want four five year crash i call them crash courses they, they, i don't know what they are if they call them alim course that's a joke really but it's it's a crash course uh but people just want the title and that's it. So this should be at least Darul Karachi, for example, has eight years or nine years, nine years. And people study for 11 years. If they do the Adadiyya and they do Takhassus, many students come and study 11 years. So you do a full eight, nine year course. Here, it's very strict. Only those students who are capable are enrolled. Strict, uh, you know, admission. Not anyone and everyone can enroll. And they dedicate their life and their study and they, there's more writing and research. Like, I think there's less of writing in our Darulums. People don't write. Mm. So here you will be writing theses. Like in the Arab world, every year the students have to prepare a thesis. When I was studying in Syria, 80 pages, you have to write an article in Arabic. Every year students ha have a thesis to, that they have to write in different topics. So they have, you know, they dedicate the time. And these guys will be the expert, muhaqqiq type of scholars. So if they do that, then inshallah, this would really help, I think. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Um, and what about um, the complaint that the Darul Uloom graduate comes out and they have like a ramp up period where life hits them and... Uh, there's, there's so much in this world that they've been protected from for, for good reason but then it's it can be a bit of a culture shock and and it's about and and doing fiqh especially for the what you're calling the alim track being uh, you need to have a bit of bit of exposure in order to be able to do fiqh properly because you have to be of the people what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. For the alim, you know, detailed course uh, that would involve exposure to the world, maybe trips, abroad trips as well, and, you know, to meeting different types of scholars and, and just, yeah, being exposed to a lot of different things. And I think that's definitely needed uh, because, of course, if you're just in a one enclosed area and you haven't seen or experienced the world, then it will cause difficulties. You won't be able to be up for the challenge of dealing with the modern world and the, the, the challenges are great in the modern world so yeah inshallah uh, Mufsab, i could be here forever i think uh, and asking you about different topics but um i wanted to uh, say that for people who are watching uh, mufti sab has a really interesting course coming out uh, understanding and navigating differences unity through diversity uh, which is going to be a really interesting course and is that on the Daralifta website you'll find yeah Daralifta.com website in the courses section okay in the courses section brilliant and then uh, there's a book that i want to buy that is coming out it's brilliant to hear that you've done this uh, which is um, a translation of mufti taqi's uh, teaching of jama'at tirmidhi uh, and you've uh, translated specifically with a lot of footnotes and additions on the chapters on trade and commerce yeah which uh, I think is, good, is a fantastic contribution. Inshallah. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And uh, alongside that, you've got a, a number of other books as yeah, well. It's, yeah, um, I I just, so, and yeah. people can find a list somewhere online? Or? Yeah, on our Darasta website, there's a book section and most of my books are there. People do order from, from there. And there's other places as well, Amazon and people, different different places people buy books and, and people make PDFs as well <laughs> from them and share them as well. So, alhamdulillah. We've got our eyes on you, PDF people. <laughs> Jazakallah khair Mufti Saab. It's been a real pleasure and uh, please make dua for us. Uh, May Allah bless all your work and all, all the effort that you are putting into all these various interviews, mashallah, and all the other type of works uh, that you're doing. And may Allah accept it from us all. Amin. Amin. Barakallah.